That is just absolutely false. That is what Pope Benedict Emeritus said about the interpretation of his work, which would appear in Traditionis Custodes. Today, we talk about the trad reception of Pope Benedict and his legacy. Jesus is King. Welcome to the One Peter Five podcast, rebuilding Christendom, restoring Catholic culture and tradition. I'm Timothy Flanders, editor in chief of One Peter Five. I want to wish everybody a happy new year, happy epiphany, no verities, no brethren. That Subtuagesima is February 5. So we've got four Sundays after Epiphany this year. Get ready for Lent. Lent is coming very soon. So we're, we're also working on a project right now to start a new lay sodality about of trad fasting. I'm really excited about this. We'll, we're going to be announcing it in a couple of weeks once we get everything together. Uh, so if you want to have a trad Lent, if you really want to be a trad and you want to take on the disciplines of our forefathers and grow in holiness, we have a fellowship, a lay sodality that we're going to be launching very soon, which will give you more information very soon. Uh, the fundraiser we had for Advent, we raised, we raised some, we raised about half of our goal. It was not what we were hoping for, but we did gain more monthly donors. What we really need is we're, we're slowly building back our monthly donor base. And that's what we really need. So we really need monthly donors, anything you can get, $5 a month, $10 a month, monthly to help us in our mission. We are a nonprofit and we rely on your donations. So please go to one 5com slash donate. We've got, just like you, we've got mouths to feed and bills to pay. So we ask you for your donations, one 5com slash donate. So today we're talking about Pope Benedict the 16th. And this presentation, I'm just going to present some of these basic uh, citations, and we'll talk a little bit about his strengths and his weaknesses. Uh, I want to emphasize, though, one of the things that uh, we did here was that um, Pope Benedict obviously is the Holy Father, and he passed away. He was the Pope Emeritus. And now, after his funeral, um, I think it's now appropriate to assess his legacy. I think before a, a prelate, especially the Pope, is laid to rest before that time, I don't think it's appropriate to really talk about criticisms or things like that. I think we should really just try to focus on mourning and praying for his soul. I think that's a, a, the dec what decorum uh, calls for. So just explaining the approach here at 1 Peter 5, um, I didn't really want to talk about any critical remarks about his holiness until after the funeral. I, I just thought that was more appropriate. And just so you know, we'll even do that for Pope, Pope Francis. I know that, you know, obviously we publish pr critical remarks about Pope Francis, but we will do the same for Pope Francis as well when he passes away, which it, it by all appearances, it, it doesn't, it doesn't appear that he does is in good health. So that could happen sometime relatively soon, you know, in the next few years. And whenever he does pass away, we will also not criticize him until after his funeral, because we really want to, uh, I think a Catholic response to that, to a death of a Pope is really to, to urge prayers for his soul and to unite these prayers to the Requiem Mass, which is offered for his soul. So we will do the same for Pope Francis. And then after his funeral, we can assess his legacy at that point. Uh, I already have the, the article... I have two articles in my mind right now for Pope Francis, which I plan to write um, at that time. Um, so we will get to um, we will get to all these informations, these uh, perspectives in just a minute. Um, so that is the reason for that. But I want to start with Athanasius Snyder. I think Athanasius Snyder really represents. Uh, a leader, I mean, he's really a leader in the trad movement, obviously. Uh, he is a bishop, and he, we really appreciate his subtlety and his nuance and his piety. Um, side note, definitely recommend his book on uh, the Catholic Mass, this text right here published by Sophia. Um, this book is one of the best out there on this topic, the Catholic Mass, in conversation with uh, Aurelio Porfiri, 
uh, published by Sophia, really a, a fantastic text because it really inspires one to prayer in the liturgy. And that's something that Pope Benedict's writings also do. But I think that Athanasius Schneider really brings this to the text in a way that's profound and pious. So here's Athanasius Schneider. I'm going to read some excerpts from his statement, and we'll discuss that. He starts with this. He says, So Marum Pontificum, quoting Athanasius Schneider, So Marum Pontificum will go down in history as epoch making. Pope Benedict XVI states that the traditional rite of the Holy Mass was never abrogated and should remain always in the church because what was holy for our forefathers and the saints must be holy for us and the future generations as well. The pontificate of Benedict XVI was worthwhile for the only reason of having issued the motto proprio sumorum pontificum, with which began the healing of the wound in the body of the church, the wound which was caused by the attitude of rejection and hatred of the venerable and millennium old rule of the mass. So something that's interesting here is that this wound is something that Joseph Ratzinger already identified in 1969. He says in his memoirs in Milestones, I don't think I have, oh, here it is. So in Milestones, I've got this stack of books I'm trying to juggle here. So in Milestones, in this text, Joseph Ratzinger says that the abolition of the Latin mass caused a rupture, caused a breach in the history of the liturgy. And so this is this wound that he was working to heal with Summorum Pontificum, which, and we'll discuss that further and, and why that's significant and why it's very important for us to understand where Ratzinger was coming from here. Continuing on with Athanasius Snyder, he says, quote, in his spiritual testament, Pope Benedict XVI left us, among others, the following substantial short phrase, which I consider the most important of all. Stand firm in the faith. Do not be confused. This pope was strong in faith, a true lover of the non-perishable beauty and firmness of the traditional rite of the Holy Mass. He gave primacy to prayer, to the supernatural view, and to eternity. This legacy will overcome thanks to the divine intervention of divine providence, which never abandons his church. The current enormous doctrinal confusion, the creeping apostasy, especially among a worldly and unbelieving cast of theologians who are the new scribes and among a creeping apostasy of not a few high-ranking clergy who are the new Sadducees, end quote. So what's interesting here is that Athanasius Snyder highlights, so this is quoting from Pope Benedict's spiritual testament. So he, Pope Benedict released a spiritual testament, sort of as his last, last sort of word to the faithful, uh, which is a short little um, exhortation. And he actually speaks about the schism in Germany as well. Um, my pastor read it from the pulpit last Sunday. Um, and so it's definitely worth reading. And Athanasius Schneider highlights an interesting phrase here, stand firm in the faith, which is an exhortation from St. Paul. And which is, in other words, be rigid. Be rigid, says Pope Benedict. Stay rigid, friends. Rigid in the faith. Contend once for the faith delivered to the faith, delivered to the saints, says St. Jude. Do not be confused. And this is something that Pope Benedict uh, says to us, the, our, our, our Holy Father Emeritus says to us in his final spiritual testament, which I, I, I love that Athanasius Netter really highlights this. Uh, do not be confused, stand firm in the faith. And so we'll talk about the tr sort of these trad strengths and trad weaknesses. And then we'll talk about the action plan. This is in particular, I want to emphasize how are we to respond as trads? How are we to receive Pope Benedict's legacy? I think in particular, uh, his excellency here highlights the primacy of prayer, the supernatural view and to eternity. Ratzinger really highlighted the primacy of prayer as a theologian, you know, obviously he was an academic, but when you read, especially for example, Spirit of the Liturgy, you read these texts by Ratzinger, you, you can detect this primacy of prayer. And it's the same thing you can detect in, in Ethos Schneider when you read the book like the Catholic Mass. So let's talk about some of the strengths. We'll start with the strengths and we'll go to the weaknesses of Benedict. Trad strengths of Benedict slash Ratzinger. So a very interesting 
historical fact that is lesser known is that Ratzinger actually acted similarly to Lefebvre in the 1970s. Now, Archbishop Lefebvre in the 1970s, so he obviously founded SSPX in 1970 with the approval of the diocesan bishop uh, at the time. So he, his his whole movement was entirely, you know, sort of legitimized. There was no controversy with it at first, um, but there were controversies that arose due to Lefebvre's resistance to the new mass, uh, his insistence that his seminarians would say only the old mass, and the declaration that Lefebvre made when various heretics came knocking on his door, which and they started to deny the resurrection and various uh, dogmas of the faith. Um, and Lefebvre, I, I think all in all, one can say uh, with certainty that Paul VI took Lefebvre's critique personally. This is something that's written in his biography. If you read the Lefebvre biography, it says that when, when Lefebvre finally had an audience with Paul VI, he had the impression that Paul VI was being offended personally. He felt that it was a personal attack on his own person. That's why Paul VI reacted so severely against Lefebvre. But when you look at it in hindsight, what's really interesting is you see a, a strong similarity to, the, to what Lefebvre was doing and what Ratzinger was doing. But you see a very difference in temperament. You see Lefebvre is uh, rather fiery in his uh, declaration of, I believe it was 1974. Uh, so he's rather fiery and, you know, rhetorically powerful, Lefebvre is. Rather, and, and whereas Ratzinger is very gentle, uh, subtle, nuanced, and that sort of thing. But he's actually doing the same thing that Lefebvre is doing. Ratzinger in the 1970s. So at this time, he was a he was a worldwide celebrity priest, academic. So his book, Introduction to Christianity, for example, was a, was a bestseller, worldwide bestseller by the 1970s. Uh, so he's well known as, as this celebrity priest. And but he's also well known as a critic of the Novus Ordo and the abolition of the, of the Latin mass. Uh, Peter Zavold in his uh, biography, as well as this is also in Last Testament. Um, it, he he notes how when he was appointed bishop, everyone held their breath because they knew that he was a huge critic of the liturgical reform. But what we notice here also, uh, what's similar to Lefebvre is that so he's a he's a critic of hyperpapalism. Joseph Ratzker is not just blindly following exactly what the Pope dictates and what the Pope intends. Uh, rather, we actually see a, a form of recognize and resist in the figure of Joseph Ratzinger in the 1970s. It's in particular, he himself, Joseph Ratzinger, he himself put into practice regarding the Latin mass and the Novus Ordo and the Pope in the 1970s, what he would later promulgate as prefect of the Holy Office in the document Donum Veritatis. So Donum Veritatis is a document that came from the Holy Office later on where Joseph Ratzinger actually describes how a theologian can actually sort of recognize and resist in a sense. Uh, he, well, he doesn't use that term, but he uses the term dialoguing and that sort of thing. But essentially, it's, it's a, a theologian who disagrees with the magisterium or has a doubt about the magisterium or has some sort of beef with the magisterium. And so he has a constructive dialogue with the magisterium. And that's exactly what Joseph Ratzinger did in the 1970s. He had a constructive dialogue with Paul VI. He made clear to Paul VI that he was, as he says in the Last Testament, he was on the same page with Paul VI in terms of, obviously in terms of the fact of reforming the liturgy, that the liturgy they needed to be reformed and that sort of thing. But he certainly was of a very different opinion as to how that reform were to go was to go about. And we'll get into that in just a minute. And so what's interesting here is that Paul VI made Ratzinger a bishop and a cardinal in the same year. It was in a period of months in 1977. This is really quite remarkable. We need to emphasize the fact that it's very rare, to my knowledge, that a priest is made a bishop and then immediately a cardinal. And so Cardinal Ratzinger participated in the conclave of 1978, which elected John Paul I, and then in immediately the next conclave, which elected John Paul II as a cardinal. So we need to recognize, so the, why is this important for trads? It's, it's important for trads because we see that the effort today, after Dutzionis Custodius, the effort today is to 
label our movement and marginalize us. It's it, people use various labels. And they use these labels in which it seems to be, I can't really judge their intentions, but it seems to be that they're, they're the, the effect of labeling fellow Catholics like trads in is, is to marginalize them to say, well, these guys are fringe people. They're out to lunch. You know, they are radical traditionalists. They're rad trads. They are schismatics. They're the centers, whatever word they use. Um, these are words that ultimately criticized Joseph Ratzker himself in the 1970s, because in a certain sense, in a certain aspect, there is this similarity to the way that Lefebvre obviously recognized and resisted Paul VI. He did so in a different way, obviously, but he was recognizing and resisting in the same on the same uh, topics of resistance. The Novus Ordo, the you know the implementation, the abolition of the Latin Mass, hyperpapalism. Joseph Rasker was recognizing and resisting those same things, but in a much different way, you know, obviously a gentler way, you know, a way that obviously won over Paul VI. He won over Paul VI to make him a bishop and cardinal. Paul VI was not afraid to make him a bishop and cardinal. So I, I, I think that Joseph Ratzker was, a t he was either, it was part of his, his own temperament in terms of Ratzker, you know, Ratzker is very shy, very, um, of a very uh, sort of a melancholic temperament, whereas Lefebvre, especially in his public declarations, Lefebvre was much more choleric in, in terms of uh, the fire that he would bring to these sort of things. So um, in any case, Joseph Ratzker won over Paul VI. Paul VI acceded to his, his uh, you know, his meteoric rise of fame. So what exactly, so the question is, how exactly did Joseph Ratzinger's critique of Paul VI, what exactly did it consist of? Well, as I said, in Milestones, he says that abolishing the Latin Mass is contrary. It introduces this wound, this breach. This is a very, now this slide here is extremely important. You need to screenshot this slide and share it, etc., because Unfortunately, there are those out there who are just, uh, they're just really not telling the truth about this, whether wittingly or unwittingly, I don't know, maybe they're ignorant, I don't, I'm not trying to judge them. I'm simply saying that what's interesting is that the, there is a claim in Traditiones Custodes, and, and we hope that the Holy Father Pope Francis was merely uninformed about this, was misinformed, or we hope that he was not malicious in this case, but we don't know exactly, but um, the, the claim is that Sumorum Pontificum was merely a pastoral concession to the SSPX. Merely a pastoral concession. You know, we got these old SSPX, you know, we've got this you know, schismatic group, but we're just going to throw them a bone because, so, we, so they don't go into schism. That's the whole point of Sumorum Pontificum. Now, what's interesting is that we have more or less an official interpretation of Sumorum Pontificum by Pope Emeritus Benedict. So this is contained in Last Testament, this book right here. Uh, Last Testament is the is a uh, interview with Peter Zavold, um, in which he discusses all these different things. Here's the here's the book right here, Last Testament. Um, this is a, a it's an interview book with Peter Zavold, and in this book, he actually asks him, was Sumorum Pontificum primarily about the SSPX, which is what Traditionus Custodis and those who attempt to misinform the Holy Father or promote this misinformation, they say that, yes, it was. It was primarily about the SSPX. It was just a pastoral concession. It had nothing to do with this intrinsic, substantial nature. Well, what's amazing um, is. that Zavold says this clearly. Whoops, let's see. Go back a minute. Uh, Teresa says, can you make this clear? You're not, is that not coming through clearly? I'm sorry if it's not. I'm gonna, I'll read it out for everybody. And and uh, if you want, I can show you this PowerPoint too. Uh, but this is on, this is in Last Testament, page 200 and 201. So Peter Zavold says to him, 
Quote, the real reauthorization of the Tridentine Mass is often interpreted primarily as a concession to the SSPX, end quote. So that right there is exactly what is said and stated in Traditionus Custodis. And it's repeated by others who seek to promote this misinformation. Again, whether wittingly or unwittingly, I don't know. But it is misinformation because what does Pope Emeritus say? He says, that is just absolutely false. That is just absolutely false. Now, notice what he says now. He says, quote, it was important for me that the church is one with herself inwardly, with her own past, that what was previously holy to her is not somehow wrong now. The right must be developed. In that sense, reform is appropriate. So we can see already reform is appropriate. This is what he would have agreed with Paul VI. Yes, reform is appropriate. Everybody agreed that reform was appropriate. Even Archbishop Lefebvre agreed that reform was appropriate. But as he says, the church must be one with herself inwardly. Continuing on with a quote from Benedict, quote, the SSPX is based on the fact that people felt the church was renouncing itself. That must not be. But as I said, my intention were not of a tactical nature. They were about the substance of the matter itself, the inward reconciliation of the church with itself, end quote. Now, in the full quote, if you look this up, he also says, he says, yes, he says, secondarily, yes, the Pope should be concerned about schism, but that's of a secondary nature. It's very clear when you read Milestones, he says that there's been a rupture in the reform already before the SSPX even exists. He, he says this right in Milestones with no consideration whatsoever to the SSPX. In other words, Sumorum Pontificum would have been necessary even if the SSPX did not exist. And that's very clear if you understand Ratzinger's, um, Ratzinger's theology of the liturgy, theology of continuity. You know, as trads, we, we criticize this hermeneutic of continuity because it's insufficient to, to solve all the problems. Yes, granted, it's insufficient to solve all the problems. But if we consider it just merely for the liturgy's sake, that, that very much sums up Ratzinger, one of Ratzinger's primary principles about his theology and his ecclesiology of the liturgy is that there has to be this continuity with the church's tradition. The church does not abolish orthodox rites. And that brings us to our next quotation here. Um, yes, so abolishing the TLM is against the spirit of the church. So now that I hope this is a little bit more clear here. Um, and uh, and uh, we'll get to, um, let me see, Teresa has a question. Let me just address this real quick here. Teresa says, why was reform appropriate? Well, I, I'll, I'll give you just one reason real quick. Um, when you attend, th there was a desire for the active participation of the faithful. And Ratzinger, in, in Spirit of the Liturgy, he, he notes that this was misunderstood to mean the faithful have to do things externally. What Ratzinger points out is what this really means is you are you you are praying the liturgy. When you go to the liturgy, you are praying the liturgy. You are gaining the spiritual fruits of the liturgy from the liturgy itself. Now, this is something that uh, this is a, a, a an appropriate reform that we we already see this in Latin Mass communities to this day, because we use missiles. There is a strong use of missiles. That is a an active form of active participation drawing the spiritual riches straight from the liturgy. Now, there, that's a whole nother conversation we want to get into. And I, in fact, there's still a great benefit to various you know, prayers during mass, praying the rosary during mass, other things like that, mental prayer during mass. But encouraging just this, this fact of, of, of praying in the liturgy, praying the liturgy, that is very much, it's obviously it was be, it existed before Vatican II, but um, Sacrosanctum Concilium was something that really encouraged that even more. So that was certainly one aspect of reform that I think is not, shouldn't be controversial to any trads. You know, we do want people to get into the liturgy, use a missal if necessary, if needed. Um, but not without discounting other forms of piety, as, like I don't, I don't particularly prefer the missal myself, but it's something that is very, very beneficial to many. So I hope that helps. Um, let's continue. This is an important aspect of it. 
abolishing the TLM is against the spirit of the church. So here's this is from 10 years of the Motu Proprio Ecclesia Day from an address of Cardinal Ratzinger, October 24th, 1998. So this helps us to understand this is this is from Ecclesia Day. This was when um, the FSSP was created. Uh, again, we're setting aside the SSPX controversy. I'm not going to comment on that because because of the complexity of that. But the very the, what we're trying to assert here is that Benedict Summorum Pontificum was about the substance of the matter itself. It's about continuity, as he says. Uh, here's the quote here from Cardinal Ratzinger. Quote. It is good to recall here what Cardinal Newman observed, that the church throughout her history has never abolished nor forbidden orthodox liturgical forms, which would be quite alien to the spirit of the church. End quote. Notice the veiled critique of hyperpapalism here. So many of these writings of Ratzinger's are, are an indirect critique of hyperpapalism. You can see the difference between Ratzinger and Lefebvre here, because Lefebvre was very much, like in the Declaration of 1974, very much going after Rome particularly, and we can debate about whether or not that was the best approach, but the point is, this quotation from Cardinal Ratzinger in 1998 is basically a, an indirect critique of Paul VI. It's an indirect critique of hyperpapalism, that the Pope himself cannot do what is quite alien to the spirit of the Church. And this is why there is a uh, there is a, a phrase in the new catechism which says that the arbitrary will of the pontiff cannot be the sole uh, the sole criterion for changing the liturgy. Let's continue. Here's another important aspect of this that Cardinal Rassiger brings out in a very important text that we'll recommend at the end of this, which is the Theology of the Liturgy, his complete works, volume 11. This is from page 544. And this is a very, very important aspect of this that uh, trads, I think, need to use here to promote our cause because, as you probably know, have heard, you know, in Traditionis Custodes, the essential argument not only the argument hinges on not only on this misinformation that um, this misinformation that Sumerian Pontificum was solely about the SSPX, but it also hinges on sort of a misinformation or an oversimplification of the fact that he's saying he says that trads are weaponizing the TLM to undermine Vatican II. Now, I think as trads, we can even concede some aspect of that because. I think that there are, as, as I've written about this at 1 Peter 5, there are some trads, I think, some in our movement who do promote a certain spirit of a neo-Jansenism where we're sort of critiquing every single thing that the magisterium does. It's sort of a de facto sedi privationism uh, that the magisterium almost doesn't exist anymore. So, I mean, I would even concede that there is an aspect of this. But Ratziger tells us that the, there's actually a much bigger problem than that. Why is it bigger? Why is it a bigger problem? Because Vatican II is a non-dogmatic council. It does it did not produce dogmas and anathemas. Yes, it produced various doctrines and it developed certain doctrines, but as uh, Pope Paul VI says, it was primarily of a pastoral nature. It was primarily about a pastoral orientation of the church in the modern world, and so the obligations of Catholics to it in terms of its dogmatic and binding character are much lesser than the dogmatic character of Trent in terms of Trent's dogmas, Trent's dogmas of the faith. We're talking the basic dogmas like the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. This is a serious problem. The bishops of the United States have recognized this. They're promoting a Eucharistic revival, which we certainly trads we certainly uh you know support our eucharistic revival so there's a much bigger problem and cardinal ratzker brings this out the problem is not primarily that trads who are represent about one to two percent of all catholics you know this this little sliver of catholics are weaponizing the venerable roman right to undermine a council which is even ratzker says is, a, is of a very modest a modest uh, dogmatic level, a modest doctrinal level. It's not a super council which surpasses all other councils. The problem, rather, the biggest problem, 
The widespread problem, Cardinal Ratzker says, is that heretics are weaponizing the Novus Ordo against Trent. Heretics are weaponizing the Novus Ordo against Trent. Now, in an address contained in this volume, he discusses various Catholics who are promoting Lutheran heresies. They're promoting Lutheran heresies. They're saying that the Novus Ordo helps to correct Trent. They're saying that the, the mass is not a sacrifice. It's a communal meal, just like Luther said. Uh, the famous Dutch catechism of the Dutch bishops promoted heresy, which was corrected or attempted to be corrected by the Holy Office in Paul VI at the time because they undermined the dogma of the real presence. This is something that various periti were promoting heresies. They were they were undermining transubstantiation, these dogmas of Trent. So Cardinal Ratzinger gives this address. This is this is later in early 2000s of this address. And he pinpoints that the reason he says that heretics are weaponizing the Novus Ordo against Trent. And, and that's why they hate the Latin mass. Listen to this quote from Ratzinger. Quote. Only against the background of the effective denial of the authority of Trent can one understand the bitterness of the struggle against allowing the celebration of the Mass according to the 1962 Missal after the liturgical reform. The possibility of so celebrating constitutes the strongest and thus for them the most intolerable contradiction of the opinion of those who believe that the faith in the Eucharist formulated by Trent has lost its validity. So the context of this quote, again, here's the citation. So this is in Cardinal Rasker Complete Works, Theology of the Liturgy, Volume 11, page 544. The concept, so this whole address, in the beginning of this address, he, he identifies by name these various Catholic theologians who are promoting Lutheran heresies. He, he, so he goes on and refutes all these Lutheran heresies that are out about the liturgy. And at the end of the address, he says, you know, basically we've got all these Lutherans. That's why they hate the Latin Mass. We've got all these Catholic and name only theologians who are promoting heresy. And that's why they love the Novus Ordo. They want to weaponize the Novus Ordo against the dogmas of Trent. That's a serious problem, ladies and gentlemen. That's a very, very serious problem. And that's, that's what trads have been trying to say, you know, for, for 60 years of our movement. We've been trying to articulate to the Holy Father and to the church authorities that this is undermining the dogmas of the real presence. This is undermining the dogmas of, of the sacrifice of the mass. And Ratzinger brings out the fact that they're weaponizing the Novus Ordo against Trent. This is a serious issue. So even if we were to concede, which I think we can concede to a degree, yes, there are some trads who want to weaponize the Latin mass. Okay. Even if that's true, we have a much bigger problem on our hands. So we need to crack down on the Novus Ordo, and this is something that's been articulated by others since Traditionus Custodis, but the fact is Cardinal Ratzinger articulated it as well, and that's why it's important for us to see. Uh, I think that overall is what I read it, tried to write in my article, is that Pope Benedict's work helps to legitimize, legitimize and, and mainstream the trad movement. That's why they, they're, you know, people want to destroy Benedict's legacy. They want to uh, throw him down the memory hole is because he it was he who helped legitimize this whole thing. Going back to the 1970s. In the 1970s, the Latin mass was almost no, you know, it was total it was almost nowhere outside SSPX chapels and a few indult masses. And it was because of Benedict, obviously Lefebvre deserves a lot of credit, Una Voce, Bishop de Castromay or others obviously are all a part of this. But obviously Benedict is a huge piece as well. And that's why they want to destroy his legacy, because he helped to make the trads mainstream, to make the Latin mass mainstream. And he did it on the highest possible principles, principles that are higher than papal authority. Principles about talking about the spirit of the church that is against the spirit of the church. That is higher than what the pope can do. The pope does not have authority to do something against the spirit of the church. His whole authority is given to him to guard the very spirits of the church, to act according to the spirit of the church. So let's continue. Oh, let me see. Any 
M. Proximus says, I just listened to part of Raymond Arroyo's interview with Cardinal Ratzker. Strange hearing the Cardinal outline the exact points of Samoran Pontificum all the time ago, while sadly clinging to Chardin and cosmic language. In that interview with Arroyo, he uses the term critical positivism. Yeah, that's that's a that is a interview from I think it was 2003. I listened to that as well recently. And he uses that term juridical positivism. And notice what that is. That is an indirect criticism of Paul VI. And so this is a this is a critique of hyperpapalism. Very important. Um, let me see. Turn to Pope to say the new mass has issues. Okay. Alphonse, if you want to clarify what you mean, I don't understand your comment, but um, let, let's continue with the presentation and we'll, we can get to other questions in time. Okay, what's next here? Okay, just a few points that I want to raise here, finishing up the strengths, and then we'll get to sort of the, some of the weaknesses that the trads might say of Benedict's legacy. One of the things I want to emphasize here is that you may hear the phrase biblical theologian. Biblical theologian, Joseph Ratzinger is known as a biblical theologian. But in point of fact, biblical theology is true theology. Today, you have people who are, theology is very much turned into an academic exercise to, to, a, uh, to a fault. And there is a, a loss of the soul of theology, which is praying the scriptures. That is the soul of theology, is praying the Holy Scriptures. This is St. Paul. St. Paul praying the Holy Scriptures and writing the New Testament. That is his theologizing. And when you look at the Church Fathers, it's the same thing. And the sentences of Peter Lombard, the sentences of Peter Lombard were the, the textbook that St. Thomas read as a student in order to get a uh, what was sort of the equivalent of a doctorate at the time, you had to write a, a commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard. So it's a commentary on a biblical commentary. And the scholastics, when you became a, an official theologian of the church, you were called a master of scripture. And so one of the things that uh, Benedict does so well is that he helps to restore a certain biblical theology as the true theology Daddy? yeah what's up bud so, so daddy we need some help need some help we were painting on mommy's computer when jack and accident we jack jack off. had an accident okay yeah. all right time for an intermission everyone say intermission intermission it's time for intermission y'all be what back does, in a minute. What does intermission mean? Intermission means that we'll be right back.
Okay. And we're back. I feared the worst when my son said there was an accident. It sounded like more than a bathroom accident, but it turns out there was no issue. So anyways, let's continue the conversation here. Um, let me see. Alphonse says, uh, Vatican II, the new mass that he had said there were major issues with, but now that I think about it as Vatican II, um, Alphonse, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. There's, there's a number of quotations. In fact, if you look up new, new liturgical movement, best quotations of Ratzinger on the liturgy, it's a compilation from Peter Kwasniewski. Um, so there's a lot of different quotations like the one we're bringing up here. Um, and that may be one of them. There's also a, there's some recent text by Peter Kwasniewski at 1 Peter 5 on Vatican II. Um, some of the, and some quotations from Ratzinger in that too. Um, okay. So biblical theology is true theology. So I, I really think that uh, Ratzinger certainly brings back a, a truly trad understanding of theology now now this existed before vatican ii it existed before Ratzinger, ratzinger especially in the greatest thomist of the 20th century uh gary gu lagrange father reginald gary gu lagrange that's that is the theologian that we promote at one peter five in particular as a godfather of the trad movement and he was truly a biblical theologian and truly a master of the scriptures and ratzinger was a master of the scriptures in a different way, particularly by not being a Thomist. He was, in fact, an Augustinian. He was an Augustinian, and this is something this he did his uh, habilitation shrift, which is like a di dissertation. He did his dissertation. He did two different um, dissertations and master's theses on uh, one was on Augustine and the other one was on Bonaventure. And obviously Augustine is Augustine, but Bonaventure is an Augustinian. Bonaventure is not a Thomist. His school of thought is eventually be, the Franciscan school of thought follows in the same path of Augustinianism, namely in particular by by keeping the more patristic Neoplatonic uh, philosophical framework of being a master of the scripture, whereas St. Thomas brings in Aristotle and creates a synthesis between uh, Neoplatonism and Aristotle in Thomism. So that's what kind of what, what makes Thomism unique and what makes uh, Bonaventure more Augustinian. And so there's, there's been these different schools of thought in the, in the church. And I think that this is, it's very trad. This is a very trad thing. It's not trad to have only Thomism. Only Thomism, that, that is actually a modern innovation to have only Thomism. Kennedy Hall has a great uh, phrase where he says, he describes it as no salvation outside Thomism. And unfortunately, some, some trads, we kind of have this idea that there is no salvation outside Thomism, but that's not true. That's not trad. That's actually modern. That's a modern innovation. Um, St. Thomas, rather, is the common doctor. He's sort of the, the standard. He is the standard by which you can judge other schools of thought. But there are these other schools of thought, which are also traditional, like like Scotism, St. Bonaventure, uh, Augustinianism, understood in a more general sense. They can go to bat with Thomism. Thomism is the common doctor and the, the sort of the standard. Uh, but these other schools of thoughts are also trad. And so Benedict, I think, is 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 um, valuable for that reason. You can see in the new catechism, you know, as trads, uh, we do have criticisms I think justified criticism of the new catechism. Uh, but to its credit, it still references the common doctor, St. Thomas, as a critical source. The, the sources of the new catechism are scripture, the fathers, uh, you know, the encyclicals, the prior councils, and Vatican II, and also the Summa. So it's very much an Augustinian uh, theological catechism. There's strengths and weaknesses to it, uh, but it still honors the common doctor. And this brings up the final strength, I think, is resourcement of Petrologia Graecae and Petrologia Orientalis. Now, what are these? These refer to the 19th century patristic revival, which began with 
figure named Ming. He was a Frenchman who published critical editions of the fathers, which before that time had really had not existed. And Ratzinger continues a, a true resource amount, which as trads, we should certainly welcome this because if we go to St. Thomas, for example, St. Thomas, St. Thomas himself was involved in a resource amount of Aristotle. And there was also, there's always been this uh, resourcing, resourcing, restoring these sources to the, the theological discourse of the church. The, so the Greek fathers and Orientalis refers to the other Eastern fathers, in particular, the Syriac tradition. The Syriac tradition is very large and very unknown. Um, but there's also uh, Coptic, Ethiopian, uh, Armenian, other fathers and other traditions uh, which helped to be resourced. I, something that I something that I, that I appreciate about the New Catechism. I remember reading it, where it quotes one of the Eastern liturgies that's not the Greek one. So it's actually I think it's a Syriac liturgy. There's an Eastern West Syriac. I don't remember which one it was that was quoted, but this is an, an example that that we trads we should welcome because we actually find common cause with Eastern traditions because they have the same the same critique of Piper Papalism. They have the same emphasis on the tradition as the one authority in the church, the continuity of the liturgy. They still have these things as well. And resourcing them is certainly a boon to the church. Um, it's, but it's, and it's the same exact thing that, that Ratzker has said regarding the Latin mass. The church does not abolish Orthodox liturgies because that would be alien to the spirit of the church. So in the same way as we, we uphold, we restore and we preserve the Latin Mass. We also do the same for, uh, you know, the East East Syriac liturgy, the West Syriac liturgy. These different liturgies that are also Orthodox and also traditional. So, let's get to uh, some of the trad weaknesses of Benedict. Um, this is, I, I, I want to break down three major weaknesses that trads would. Uh, would bring out, I think. Um, this is the lack, the, number one is the lack of the charitable anathema. What do I mean by this? <clears throat> excuse me. The charitable anathema, excuse me, is, is a phrase from one of the godfathers of the trad movement, Dietrich von Hildebrand. It's the not, it's the name of an essay that he wrote called the charitable anathema. And then it's the name of this printed book, which is a collection of his essays. But in 1965, in the summer of 1965, Dietrich von Hildebrand with his wife, Alice had an audience with Paul the six and Dietrich von Hildebrand said to Paul the six. And so this is before Vatican II ended. So already the, the rampant revolutionary her heresy is everywhere. And Dietrich von Hildebrand says to Paul VI, you must condemn heresy. It's the only way. Unfortunately, Paul VI said, according to Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, that was too harsh. In fact, Dietrich von Hildebrand wrote out a, a, a model anathema for all these heresies that were rampant already in the summer of 1965. Paul VI said that was too harsh. Now, shortly after the council, Ottaviani wrote a letter to all the bishops of the entire world and said, you have to condemn heresy. You have to crack down on heresy. Archbishop Lefebvre wrote back to him. This is something we published at 1 Peter 5. It's called shortly after the council, Lefebvre responds to Ottaviani. And Lefebvre said, hear, hear, absolutely. Have, the, have, have every bishop condemn heresy let the Holy Father condemn heresy. This is so. This has been the beating drum of the trad movement since before Vatican II ended. It is, it is, in my view, one of the single most important things besides perhaps destroying the Latin Mass uh, and correcting the situation. Dietrich von Hildebrand says in his essay, "This is the proven solution. This is the proven solution that has always been the solution in the history of the Church." We've always had this solution. It always works. It's proven. And unfortunately, Benedict did not issue the charitable anathema. 
And, you know, this is continuing the same weakness that John Paul II displayed and Paul VI displayed, was that there was a reluctance to impose a, a an anathema. Now, to his credit, John Paul II, under the guidance of Ratzker, did impose a new uh, oath against modern, a form of oath against modern, it was called the Oath of Fidelity, which is where people sh- need to um, have this oath and 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 uh, subscribe to the, the Professio Fidei, uh, the new one, which is of a three-tiered system. But we, as trads, we would advocate, we would we would say this, the solution ultimately is this anathema. Say, if anyone says X, Y, Z, let him be anathema. Because there's a lot of people saying X, Y, Z out there. And again, going back to the dogmas of Trent, you know, we could just renew, I mean, <laughs> one easy thing is we could just renew the, the, the anathemas of Trent. Let's just remind everyone the anathemas of trends are are still in force. So if anyone says that the mass is not a sacrifice, let him be anathema. That would anathematize people who are weaponizing the Novus Ordo. So um, that's the first weakness that we would say, hey, as trads, we really wish that Benedict would have done this and that we would we would still we would continue as we've done up under Paul the Sixth, John Paul II, and Benedict, and now under Francis and any pope that comes along, we would we would say, please issue the charitable anathema, because this is the proven solution against heresy. Now, number two, uh, a lack of pastoral approach to academic. Now, here's what I mean by that. I think very much what's interesting. I, I wrote, I uh, read, I um, can't remember. I read this, but there was a proposal by Archbishop Lefebvre actually at Vatican II. He said, we should produce two texts. We should produce a text for theologians. And we should also produce a text for the lay faithful. That was, that proposal was rejected, unfortunately. But Vatican II is the first, really the first council really in history um, that is written and it's targeting the lay faithful. It's targeting non-theologians. It's trying to speak in everyday language. But the trouble is, and there are good parts of Vatican II, but the trouble is there are confusing parts about Vatican II. There are parts about Vatican II which are confusing for the average Catholic. They're not only confusing, but they, you know, some hotshot Jesuit academic comes along and starts quoting Vatican II in order to undermine dogmas of the church. So they're quoting Vatican II in order to promote heresy. And to the lay faithful, you know, you're not a theologian. You just know your catechism. You know your Baltimore catechism. And then somebody comes along and quotes Vatican II and promotes heresy. And you don't really know what to do here. And I think Benedict's, unfortunately, Benedict's pastoral experience was very limited. His experience was almost 100% um, academic. So he was ordained a priest in the 1950s, and he was almost immediately, he became an academic priest. So he was a professor. Um, And then through the 1970s, then he was appointed bishop of Munich, but he was only bishop for, I think it was only a year, actually, uh, or a couple of years. Um, before he was brought to Rome, he was prefect of the Holy Office. I think, um, and I think that this has colored his approach is that there's, you know, for the lay faithful, it's sometimes very difficult to understand some of these basic things. Uh, I think the new catechism is a great example. We had Matthew Plesion a couple, couple weeks ago. Uh, you know, even if we, if we, if we say there's no, uh, issue with the new catechism in terms of like a uh, error or anything like that. Let's just say that, you know, just concede that for a minute. If we look at the new catechism, the new catechism is basically like a master's level course in the Catholic faith. It's not conducive to teaching high schoolers or even your average lay person. It's not conducive to that because it's not really simplified. It's too academic. It's too uh, loquacious, too many words. This is why catechisms have very much, you know, simplify, I, dare I say, dumbed down. You know, we need to have this very simple Catholic faith, Catholic 101. You know, look at the Baltimore Catechism, 
you know, this question and answer format. Pius the 10th has the same format. These just really basic breaking it down. And that's, that's really pastoral. You know, this really pastoral, like just your common average Joe Catholic who needs to just know his catechism and pass it down to the faithful. Um, there can be, and I think we see this in Rasker, this, it's just too academic. And I think uh, now in the, our final example, this is, I think, an issue which is particularly uh, acute for the lay faithful, namely the inerrancy of the Holy Scripture. The doctrine, the dogma of the inerrancy of the Holy Scripture is that there are no errors in the Holy Scripture. There are no errors in the Holy Scripture. Why is this acute for the lay faithful? Well, lay faithful, if they're reading the Holy Scripture, they need to be able to trust that Jesus Christ in the Gospels is the true Jesus Christ of history. They need to be able to trust these things which is the foundation of that is trusting that the Holy Scripture speaks the truth, that there are no errors of history. Um, this, in fact, was one of the foundation, foundational tenets of modernism. So when Leo the Thir Leo XIII condemned um, Alfred Loisy, he was condemning in uh, Providentesimus Annos. Um, I'm sorry, Providentesimus Deus. Um he condemned the idea of limited inerrancy, limited inerrancy, i.e. that there are errors in the scripture. He condemned that idea, and that was condemned again by Benedict the 15th, and then it was condemned again by Pius the 12th. This is something that I detail in my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible for Traditional Catholics. I document this heresy of limited inerrancy. This is, this is a very basic idea that I think that the lay faithful can comprehend. It's not this high, very technical, nuanced, um, this very technical and nuanced idea that only theologians can understand. The lay faithful can understand the Bible is true, period. And so it's a very, very important thing. But Unfortunately, this is something that I, I bring out again in my text. So if you want all the evidence and all the citations of what I'm saying, you could read my book. Um, but essentially what happens is um, this idea of limited inerrancy is condemned multiple times by popes. But at Vatican II, it is brought up again, uh, namely by Cardinal Koenig of Vienna and others push for the idea that the, the Holy Scriptures contain error. And ultimately what happens is the, the text that is adopted, De Verbum, paragraph 11, is phrased in such a way as to not exclude this heresy. However, now, now in fairness, the relatio of De Verbum can excludes the heresy and the citations of Dei Verbum exclude the heresy, but the bare text itself, if you're, you know, if you're, again, if you're, you know, this lay faithful, you're this person, you know, in the pew, you just know your catechism, your catechism told you that the Bible is inerrant. And then the hotshot Jesuit comes to town and quotes Dei Verbum 11, as they did. I have the citation on my book, quoting America magazine. They say, well, Dei Verbum 11 allows that the scripture has errors. In fact, James Martin, as I quote in my book again, James Martin used this very thing when he was debating on Twitter. He was debating Bishop Snyder. He quoted Dave Verbum 11. In fact, this text here, this text here, Vatican II, Renewal Within Tradition, uh, edited by Matthew Lamb and Matthew Levering. Now, Matthew Levering is, is a good theologian. He, is, he promotes uh, resourcement uh, Thomism. Uh, over with Nova et Vetera. Um, but in this volume itself is contained two different essays on Dei Verbum. One of them by Francis Martin and an exegete that I appreciate. I've appreciated his exegesis in the past, but unfortunately he actually promotes this heresy. He says this in his, his essay in this volume. And uh, then, but then the other essay says, no, that's not the correct interpretation. So Clearly, we have a confusion of a ser very serious nature that is occasioned by Dei Verbum Levin. 
again, technically Dave M11 does not teach this, but nevertheless, the hair, the spread of this heresy certainly was occasioned by Dave M11. Um, and what's really sad to me, because I, I certainly, in my view, uh, I, I certainly believe that this, this particular heresy, namely limited inerrancy, is the foundation of all of modernism. Uh, as, as Pius X says, modernism is based on the evolution of dogma. In other words, that the Holy Scriptures are not, they, they sort of can be corrected over time by evolution. So there's sort of this evolution of dogma that evolved from what was there before. And what's really interesting is that there was a dubium given to Benedict the 16th to resolve this very issue. And he did not respond to this dubium. Now, I don't really know why exactly. Um, perhaps he wanted further deepening of the issue. But I think this goes back to the number the number two critique, which is that, that pastoral approach versus too academic. Sure. I, I mean, there are nuances. There are shades of this different aspect of it. And Providentissimus Deus discusses some of these things. For example, um, Leo XIII discusses the ferment and how the Holy Scriptures de describe the cosmos in a certain way that is, is true according to what your senses perceive. For example, the sun rises. You know, if so, if you even if you believe in heliocentrism, you can still say the sun rises because that's what it looks like, and that's not that's not false. That's simply describing what your senses describe. So there, you know, there are nuances to this. Okay, I get that. That's fine. There's nuances to this, but shouldn't the faithful be given a, a just a very crystal clear some uh, uh, you know a package deal to say as it says in the catechisms, you know, the scriptures are inerrant. We can trust the holy scriptures. The Jesus of this, the Gospels is the Jesus of history. Moses in the in the in the Pentateuch is Moses of history. So I think that's a very very important thing for the lay faithful to know, and I think that goes back to this sort of there's it's too academic, you know. There's 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 a there's an abundance of documents put out by Ratz. Um, I mean, I, I think of another document of of Cardinal Ratzker when he was prefect of the Holy Office, which is uh, Dominus Jesus. Dominus Jesus is a very good document. It, it really condemns uh, religious indifferentism. It condemns the abuse of ecumenism, the abuse of interfaith dialogue. It's a very good document. But, you know, he, he took 10,000 words to say something that could have been said in 500 words. You know, as trads, we would say, yes, thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Holy Father, for, you know, this long reflection but is there another i mean can we can we can we not promulgate demos jesus for theologians to understand and then also promulgate a five point anathema anyone who says that jesus christ is not the one way to salvation let him be anathema you know that's that's the basic thrust of dominus jesus why not add a, a few anathemas to it and that's that's what the council like. I mean, that's what Trent did. That's what these various councils did. They would have a long discussion. You know, this is what is Vatican one. You have a discussion. You have you know, you can get into that nuance and that theological depth into the discussion. But then it ends with some canons. It ends with these anathemas, which allow the faithful to get at this very basic breakdown of what we're dealing with here. So uh, this, I think, um gets at some of the weaknesses that, that trads might uh, bring out. Again, uh, we do this with respect to uh, Benedict XVI Emeritus, you know, pray for his soul. Uh, but we do so respectfully considering his legacy. And, and always, you know, it, it's, you know, popes, it's important that we need to realize that popes cannot answer every single issue. And hindsight is always 2020. And so, you know, I always bring up the example of Pius the, the 11th. Pius XI, who made major prudential errors in his pontificate, you know, condemning Padre Pio, condemning the Cristero War, condemning Action Frances, failing to consecrate Russia, possibly causing World War II as a result. So, you know, Pius, but Pius XI had a lot of good things about a pontificate. But the problem is that, you know, a, a pope has so much to do and a huge bi bureaucracy 
You know, if someone misinforms him about Padre Pio and he does the wrong thing, that can happen. So it's just we need to, you know, assess these things charitably, sympathetically. Um, you know, maybe there were good reasons for what Pope Benedict or any pope did or did not do that we don't know about. So it's important to keep that in mind. So finally, let's talk about the action plan here. Considering all this, what do we do? What do we do as trads? What, would, what do we do as Catholics? And then we'll get to uh, your comments and questions in just a few minutes. Number one, centrality of praying the liturgy and the scriptures. This is something that, it, this is a strength of Benedict. It's something that very much um, is something that you, one can bring out. Someone, someone can definitely get out of reading uh, script, reading uh, Benedict. I'm reading the um, the uh, depth from the depths of our hearts. His intervention, uh, Benedict and Cardinal Seurat, their intervention under Pope Francis, which is very significant. Um, but there, there's the centrality of praying the liturgy and the scriptures. And this is very traditional thing to do. Um, it, so it's very critical that we do this above all. You know, if you're not doing this, then don't do the rest of the things. This is primary. This is central. This is it as trats. Um, number two, we want to, I mean, this phrase needs to be what we repeat. <laughs> Uh, is this phrase from Benedict the Emeritus, quote, that is just absolutely false, end quote. Because unfortunately, people are still saying this mimps information that's contained in Traditionus Custodis. But that is just absolutely false. And Benedict Emeritus tells us. So it's very important that we, we say that and say why that is, as we explained earlier. Uh, recognize and resist on the TLM imitates Joseph Ratzinger in a sense. There's a, there's a form of recognize and resist that he himself practiced and explained in Donum Veritatis. If you go to um, this article here, let me see if I can do this without um, the morality of correcting a Pope. Uh, 1 Peter 5 Morality of Correcting a Pope by Michael Cirilla. He's a theologian from Franciscan University. And he discusses Donum Veritatis. And he explains the framework of this, rec this form of recognize and resist that Cardinal Ratzker himself explains and also exemplifies in his own life. So that's critical for us to see because Joseph Ratzker and Benedict allows, he, he provides this, as I said, this this mainstreaming of the trad movement, because we see that our enemies are trying to marginalize us and label us. They're trying to set up their own self-proclaimed inquisition against us. But we can simply say, hey, look at Joseph Ratzinger. Look at what he did. Look at what he said. We're you know, if 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 we even go out of bounds, um, you know, if you look at the basic principles here. You can see Joseph Rassiger's work in the same principles of the trad movement. Now, I think of the consolation of the scriptures. This is from St. Paul. This was a recent epistle, actually. I think it was um, an advent, actually. But um, he gives us this consolation of the scriptures in his deep biblical theology. Again, the true theology. There's actually a... Um, let me recommend this uh, catechism. Let's see. Let me see if I can find this. Oh, let me grab it. Catechism of the seven sacraments. So if you go to um, this, this um, catechism right here for the kids, it's, it's a really great catechism, believe it or not. And it's based on Benedict. It's a Lego catechism uh, based on his scriptural theology. Catechism of the Seven Sacraments. And it is based on Benedict's teaching about covenant. And this is a very trad catechism because of its use of typology in the Old Testament. And it's really beautiful for the kids. It's a really great uh catechetical tool to use 
Uh, so we definitely recommend that catechism of the second seven sacraments. It's a Lego catechism for the kids uh, based on Benedict. Uh, certainly after we get our own spiritual life in order, it is our duty to catechize our children. And these, and, and certainly the consolation of the scriptures is found in this is exemplified in this catechism, the seven sacraments, which is based on his writings. And we, we really gather the consolation of the scriptures through Ratzinger uh, as one of the, the modern writers that, that can bring a lot of that. Um, finally, his works, which can be a great help to trads reading through their, the entire works and seeing the greater principles that, that are very much the principle of tradition, which is shared by the trad movement. So uh, we mentioned the spirit of the liturgy. That's his sort of his, his critical, um, his, his most famous work on this topic. We also have um, this, this volume here, the collected works, theology of the liturgy. Um, let me get my dog out of here just a minute. Here, baby. Um, <clears throat> so Joseph Rassiger collected works right here, theology, of the liturgy, um, a very good text, but there, there are two missing texts that are very important that I would recommend as well to add to this. I have them printed out and added to my volume here. Uh, one is the one that we already quoted. That was that 10th anniversary Ecclesia Day address, which mentioned that abolishing Orthodox liturgies is against the spirit of the church. Um, but there's also the address to the Chilean bishops um, that happened shortly after Monsignor Lefebvre was excommunicated, unfortunately. Um, but this was on 13th of July, 1988. And this is an important address as well for understanding uh, Ratzinger's theology of the liturgy. Um, and finally, his two recommended texts from Ratzinger are very important as well. If you want to study this, uh, there's uh, first, there's reform of the Roman liturgy, its problems and background. Um, Monsignor Klaus Gamber. This was um, a, a German theologian who was ostracized because he was a critic of the Novus Ordo and Ratzinger defended him. And his book is certainly highly recommended, reprinted by Roman Catholic books. And then the great Elquin Reed, Organic Development of the Liturgy. And very much this, this whole text is a uh, explanation of texts from Sacrosanctum Concilium regarding the organic development of the liturgy, as well as the New Catechism, paragraph 1125. And so this whole text brings out these things, and, and Cardinal Ratzker recommended these texts. He wrote the forwards, or he recommended them um, to the faithful. So we certainly recommend them, and, and they bring great good and great boon to the trad movement, um, because it seems that the enemies of the trad movement want to try to remove these parts of Benedict. They want to try to um, uh, sanitize, if you will, these various teachings and comments of Cardinal Ratzker and Benedict XVI in order to silence and marginalize the trad movement. So it's very important. So let's get to uh, your comments and questions. Um, Peter says, maybe trads are not rigid enough in condemning heresy. Well, ultimately... We, we want we want the Pope to give them heresies ultimately, uh, which we believe will be um, allow us to move forward. Um, and uh, but sticking to our catechism, you know, Benedict the Sixteenth's um, spiritual testament that Athanasius Steiner brings out: uh, stand firm in the faith, as Saint Paul says. Do not be confused. And th this is a perfect time to plug the um, Trata box. Tradivox um, series, which is reprinting all of the old catechisms. This is the way that you stand firm in the faith and do not be confused. You can read the old catechisms, which often have a clarity, unfortunately, that is lacking in the new catechism, lacking in, in the new documents, which are very loquacious and difficult to understand. We'll also recommend um, 
the text by Rome by uh, Matthew Pleasy, the Roman Catechism explained for the modern world. So this is what takes the Roman Catechism. So this is the really thick Roman Catechism here, and then here is the um, the shorter commentary, which helps to try to distill that for the modern world. Uh, you know, there's there are um, things in the Roman Catechism that are outdated. Literally, you know, it makes reference to old customs that, you know, I don't even know what they are, things like that, like talking about different technologies and, and various things that, you know, no one knows what that is. Um, and so it makes these passing comments, which are dated uh, or, it, or it explains things that uh, are hard to understand in our own day. So this is the commentary that helps for uh, modern catechisms. Um, Teresa says, I need that book. My husband recently pointed out he saw that a verse was removed from Bibles on prayer and fasting in Mark or Matthew. We searched our Bibles and only had the two had the verse, his grandmother's Bible and the Dewey Reams. I believe you're referring to the, the comment by um, recently by my colleague um, and esteemed editor of um, LifeSite News, John Henry Weston, he had a video, I think it was maybe a month or two ago, about that verse. I think it was in Matthew, if I recall. I can't remember. But uh, so that verse, so we actually do talk about it in this in in um, introduction of the Holy Bible. That particular verse, uh, actually, I don't think we mentioned this particular verse, but I can tell you about that verse. Um, that verse is a variant, what's known as a variant, which is a a text of the Holy Scripture, which is not contained in all the manuscripts. So what we have is we have all these manuscripts that are written in the original tongue, Greek, and also Latin, and also a lot of other texts, or ancient languages. So these are all these manuscripts. They're all these copies of copies of copies of copies of the original text. And so a variant is refers to a, a part of the Scripture, so a line, like the prayer, part on prayer and fasting, uh, which does not appear in all the manuscripts. So it's only in some of them, not all. And so modern scholars who, who deal in what's called textual criticism, textual criticism refers to reading all these different manuscripts and sifting through them and trying to figure out what is the best approximation of the original text. So in my book, I, we talk in detail all about that. And it is actually a trad thing it is a trad thing to do textual criticism. That's what St. Jerome him, himself did in his own day. And his own, the Vulgate, his Latin Vulgate was in fact controversial. There's a, there's a famous dispute between Augustine and Jerome on this very issue. Um, so, but what was fascinating is that the, what we see is that the church retains these variants. Now, so it may be that that verse was in the original text. It may not be. But even if it's not in the original text, a variant represents the earliest and most authoritative commentary on the text. And so it should be still included in the text, especially in the devotional text used by the faithful. Um, so again, this is another breakdown of this sort of academic on the one hand and the pastoral on the other. You know, the lay faithful should be reading the Dewey Reams because it has all these variants. It doesn't remove them. It can, includes them because the church, church's liturgy has sanctified them. The church has approved them. Um, and we go into all those in more detail and all the different principles and everything going on in that book, in this book. But um, but that's the reason that very, that particular verse, uh, Teresa, is not in some Bibles. Um, let's see. Lisa says, doctrine, scripture, and tradition is objective and direct. Modernism is subjective and squishy, can be twisted into a variety of shapes, indirect and chaos. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is the way that the modernists work. Essentially, they assert that religion is merely a uh, pious sentiment that you have in your heart inside, and it's just how you feel and that sort of thing. It's not objective. Absolutely. Um, one of the interesting tidbits about Ratzinger's life is that he actually did his, as I said, his habil habilitation shift on Bonaventure and Bonaventure's theory of revelation. And he talked about how there is a revelation of the person of Jesus Christ 
to the person. So, so Jesus Christ reveals himself to me. That is an aspect of revelation. And as the, the, the epistle to the Hebrews, St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews says in the very first lines, uh, God has spoken to us in his son. And so this is the revelation. This is what this is the good part about Dei Verbum, which the first few paragraphs of Dei Verbum talks about how God reveals himself. And that's sort of the first revelation in the sense of that is the revelation. The revelation is God revealing himself. Um, so the problem with that is that there is a subjective aspect to that. There is an objective aspect because God is objectively true, but then. He is true, but then he reveals himself to you personally. And that's also true. So your experience of God, your experience of the truth of God, even though it takes place within your subjective, you know, within your heart, within your intellect, even though it happens sort of inside you subjectively, that's still true. But you need to harmonize the two because the modernists want to take the subjective and they want to destroy the objective, destroy the objective doctrine. Uh, and Ratzinger, using Bonaventure, he brings out the aspect of the subjective without sacrificing the objective. The subjective without sacrificing the objective. There needs to be both. Um, let me see here. Since mine is part of my tread, don't give them ideas. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, th this is this is the only way out. Um, Cirillo is a brilliant theologian, great professor at Franciscan. Excellent. Sounds like Lisa maybe has had him. Um, I've never had the pleasure to be taught by Dr. Cirillo, but absolutely. Um, Teodoro, um, shout out to Hispanidad, uh, says... Will there be or have there been debates in regard to specific points or specific Nouvelle Théologie theologians anywhere online? Thank you, sir. Um, debates about specific points. Um, I'm not aware of a lot of debates. Um, Nouvelle Théologie, in, in the broadest sense of the term, represents sort of the dominant theology, theology today even though there are there is a very vast difference between uh, what we might call the Concilium Journal, Hans Kuhn and, and other heretics who are promoting heresy, you know, Cardinal Casper using his ressourcement of Greek marriage theology to promote Amoris Laetitia, that sort of thing, versus the Communio Journal associated with Ratzinger is a very, it's a totally different methodology, which is far more orthodox. Obviously, it's tradition-minded, um, which, you know, we would have, trads would have common cause with the Communio school against the Concilium school. Um, but the problem is that uh, there is sort of this dominance of these two sort of wings of a, a broader thing that we can call Nouveau Intelligy or we can call Retour Simon, we can call Vatican II theology or whatever. Um, and that's sort of dominant and the trad school, the neo scholastic school, uh, the Chetus at Vatican II is marginalized, even the church today. So um, there's not a lot of debates um, of, in this regard. Um, so I, I think that that's a problem, but it's something that 1 Peter 5 we're trying to bring out in a, in a written manner is bringing out the godfathers of tradition, the godfathers of the trad movement. Um Father Reginald Gary Goulou-Grange, the members of the Chetus Internationalis Patrum at Vatican II and their allies. Um, so in particular, we want to bring out the conversation that existed in the 40s between the neo-scholastic Roman school and the burgeoning uh, Nouvelle Théologie in France, which is a critical uh, for this whole conversation. So I, don't, I hope that helps, but I, I don't really know of a lot of debates if I understand your uh, question correctly here. But, well, that's all we have. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. Um, you can email me if you have any questions. I hope the PowerPoint was clear so you can see it. Um, but I do think that that is absolutely false. That's the thing that we need to say. Uh, we need to repeat as trads. Um, 
which helps us utilize the strengths, the trad strengths of Benedict. Um, and we still have those weaknesses that we would like to be corrected. And, and so we continue in our movement. So hope this has been helpful. Let's offer this to our lady as we always do under her Russian icon, the Russian icon of Fatima. Uh, let's offer up an Ave Maria and um, we can uh, offer this all to Our Lady and ask her to purify our intentions, purify our, our trad movement, purify us so that we can offer up the holy sacrifice of the Mass with a pure heart, with the merits of all the saints and the infinite merits of Christ in his holy passion. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu de arbus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Blessed Emperor Carl, pray for us. Saint Maximilian Kolbe, pray for us. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King.